Hi everyone, good morning. Welcome to day five, I believe, yes, of our flashcard ECG challenge. Today we're diving into this killer diagnosis, pulmonary embolism. It's one of those conditions that hides in plain sight. There is no way you would have worked in the emergency department or in medical department and you would not have seen quite a few cases of pulmonary embolism. And well, the good thing about it is, it, is you, you have some risk factors to work with. But the bad thing about it is that it could be literally anybody that comes in with a chest pain. So unlike others that you have some ST elevation or you think MI or you have T-wave inversion, you think this, it can present with any of those things. It could be sinus tachycardia, non-specific ST changes. They usually mention the S1, Q3, T3, but that's pretty much rare. In exams, they will tell you the most important finding for a pulmonary embolism on ECG is what, and the answer will be sinus tachycardia. But in practice, they might have a completely normal ECG and become be having a pulmonary embolism. Although the, the consensus around here is that if you're seeing ECG changes in a person confirmed to have pulmonary embolism, then it is most likely um, a very bad pulmonary embolism. For it to show up in the art tracing, then it actually is quite significant and may have a poorer prognosis. Um, so how do you not miss it? That's what exactly we're covering today. From symptoms to ECG clues to national protocols to the steps you must take to save that life. So let's go. Pulmonary embolism is a clot, usually from the legs that lodges in the lungs. It's not just a lung issue. It's a right heart strain problem. And mortality without treatment is 30%. But with timely diagnosis, that can drop to under 10%. And so that's why this is important. Again, um, in the area where I work currently, you have a lot of elderly people around. You have a lot of people with risk factors for pulmonary embolism. They are not very active. They smoke and a few other risk factors we will talk about soon. But if you have unexplained shortness of breath or unexplained difficulty in breathing, that is dyspnea, or you have unexplained chest pain or tachycardia, Think pulmonary embolism, especially if the patient looks too sick for the vitals or for the numbers you're getting. Now, this is the popular S1Q3 T3. To be fair, I think I've seen this more in textbooks than in real life. We can see here that what that means is that you have a prominent S1 in your lead one. And in your left three of your ECG strips, you have your prominent Q wave. Again, where is my annotator? I was just going to bring that up for you. So this is your S. Um, we know that this is your P. This is your Q. This is your R. So the negative deflection here, that so-called negative deflection is your S1. So you have a prominent S1 in one and you have Q3, your Q wave, your kind of pathologic Q wave in S3. Then you have T wave inversion still in lead three. Now, a lot of Myself and my colleagues have said that we've seen this in a person that does not have um, pulmonary embolism. I particularly have seen this in a patient that had some um, serotonin, um, serotonin, um, serotonin malignant syndrome. So you can imagine how very non-specific this can be. So it's just good to keep your mind open with this particular ECG finding. It can be very rare, um, an ECG finding for even though it. it even though it is supposed to be pathognomonic for um, an, an ECG with pulmonary embolism finding. Now, what do we find here? We find the classical S1Q3 finding. You can see that, for example, you have your a prominent S wave in your lead one, right? And then you see your so-called pathologic Q waves here in three. And then your T wave is inverted in lead three as well. Your T wave is inverted in lead three. And this, in this case, this was actually um, a pulmonary embolism. But again, keep your mind open that any case, even if an ECG is normal, we've discussed this when we were doing the basics of ECG course. For me and for my students and the people that I coach, the context is king. The context would help you to actually take the best clinical discussion and um, decision regardless of your ECG findings. Now, the causes of pulmonary embolism, we know that it can be, um, if you've had a previous DVT, when you look at the well scoring system, you find that the well score 
talks about a previous DVT or PE, um, if they've had prolonged immobility or if they're housebound, if they are on palliative care for cancer or on active cancer therapy. We also know that they are important um, if they've had surgery within the last few weeks. That would also be a very a risk factor they'll be scoring for on the well score for DV or for PE. If um, they've had surgery, especially orthopedic surgeries, in the orthopedic words, especially um, from a few days to a week after surgery, it is particularly quite common. It can be a, an area, a gray area of, just permit me two seconds. Um, could you please turn off the water a bit? Thank you. Okay, so I just try to get some background noise off, but thank you. So a DVT, like I said, is a risk factor. Smoking, obesity, oral contraceptives, and hormonal therapy let your um, suspicion go high for a pulmonary embolism when they're now coming with breathlessness or chest pain. Yes, I remember that a very popular celebrity, and that happens a lot with celebrities that have died from PE. They take longer flights, then they begin to develop breathlessness. Your 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 cue should go high for a pulmonary embolism. But longer flights in people that are already prone to having a PE and not necessarily. I've, I've seen quite a number of young people die from having a pulmonary emb embolism that was unprovoked. So unprovoked pulmonary embolism is you cannot place out what could have triggered this embolism and then they did die from pulmonary embolism so it's a very important topic and the ECG on well I would argue that in many cases the ECG does help even in this pulmonary embolism cases the ECG helps especially like I said the ECG helps you to know that this embolism because not all pulmonary embolism is actually very dangerous you could do um, a CTP and find a small embolism or an embolism that does not significantly occlude the pulmonary vasculature. Um, and that would not mean that you would go in and actively intervene. So it's just good to keep in mind that, um, um, just to keep in mind about when a pulmonary embolism can become massive, submassive, when it can become dangerous. But if they are becoming symptomatic, fine. I think the point I was trying to make here is that the ECG, what it does in the case of pulmonary embolism, it can help you with prognosis. It can int you. It can cue you up that there is a large, um, especially if you're having futures of right heart strain on your ECG. The risk factors, we've talked about this. Um, yes, inherited clotting disorders, if they have factor five lighting and they're coming to you with breathlessness, let the alarm signals go off for a pulmonary embolism. If, um, yes, we've mentioned the others as well. According to NICE guidelines and many other national guidelines, you use, a, you use the world score, some use the Geneva scores as your first port of call when you're suspecting a PE. Now, just know that pulmonary embolism can be a mimic. Like I've said, I've expressed my frustration with pulmonary embolism in the sense that it does not present in a textbook kind of way. You have dyspnea, they could be um, tachycardic, they could have pleuritic chest pain. Um, pleuritic chest pain, especially I find out, can be an important cause of pulmonary embolism, can be an um, important um, symptom of pulmonary embolism. They have pain that worsens with breathing and with inspiration and bits like that think pulmonary embolism as well they could have syncope in a massive pe they could have low-grade fever and if a dvt is present that's why in a patient with chest pain when you're documenting and i particularly i know documentation is not the same thing as actually caring for a patient well but your documentation has to be tight to explain your line of thought when you're seeing the patient with chest pain because if any on two what things happened we want to see in your documentation whether it's one or two or three lines that you actually did think about a pe so you've got to be able to delineate that you checked the calves they were soft non-tender and that is why you did not think there was a pulmonary embolism in this patient and um the well score for pe um with the simplified version that version that you just need to know is that there are only two parameters that score a three only two parameters, if they have signs of a DVT, like that, that is the calves are swollen, tender, or there's some tenderness along the um, deep venous um, course, and you're thinking of a DVT, that's course three. If 
pulmonary embolism is your first most likely diagnosis, that's cause three. Then the other things you need to know is if they've had immobility, they are recent immobility, they've been housebound or recent surgery, that will get you a 1.5. If they've had a previous DVT or P, that will get you a 1.5. Hemoptysis scores one, cancer scores one. And if you put together, you sum up your scores and they are less than or equal to, they are greater than or equal to four, then AP is more, is, is likely that you proceed to either do a D-dimer or a CTPA based on the clinical context that you have with you. So the, the diagnosis, we talked about a D-dimer test. If they're scoring significantly on your well score, go ahead and do a D-dimer. Um, in practical sense, if I really think that the patient does have um, many times this correlates to be fair, but I've had cases where the well score wasn't too bad, but the D dimers were high. But bear it in mind that you can have D dimers high in someone that is already taking a blood thin. Now, if they're on their river roxaban and the base, the D dimer will be skewed. Also, D dimers can be high in terms of a chest infection. So, what we often do is we get a chest x ray, we do an ECG, we do the chest x ray, and when the chest x ray yeah, and you know, it all depends on your clinical context. But if you're thinking, is this an infection or is this pulmonary embolism? And you do your chest x-ray and it's showing um, some consolidation and you're having fever, you're having high inflammatory markers on your blood. If you do your D-dimers, it's going to be high anyways, when this is just a case of um, a chest infection, maybe a pneumonia. But if you have reason to still suspect that this is, you need to rule out a P, then why not go ahead and do your CTP? But your D-dimers will be raised in quite a number of conditions, and it's important. Then we have the VQ scan, the Doppler ultrasound for DVT as well. Now, we talked about the ECG findings in PE. Sinus tachycardia, like I said, textbook says it's most common. You could find the S1Q3T3 pattern, which can be very rare. You see your right axis deviation. You see right bundle branch block. You see your T-wave inversions. If you followed me through day one, day two, day three, day four, you would have no problem recognizing a right axis deviation, recognizing a right bundle branch block, recognizing a T-wave inversion, knowing what your anterior legs, your arterial legs, and your V1 to V4. So imagine T-wave inversions there. You could have... And to be fair, I've seen a, a PE ECG where there were just so many, it looked like ischemia so bad, but it wasn't ischemia. They had borderline drops. And when we eventually did a CTPA, they had massive, a massive saddle PE, saddle sized PE um, on, the, on, on the CTPA. So it's important when you're seeing changes that are not adding up to a heart attack to consider pulmonary embolism as a differential. Um, think of it this way, just to quickly add, clinical suspicion, you use a well score, right? If you have low interme or intermediate well score, do a D-dimer. If negative, you ruled out your PE. If positive, you do a CTPA. If you have high well score, go straight to your CTPA. So it's a step one, step two, step three. Use well score. If you're not too sure, do the D-dimer to help you. The D-dimer is negative, PE ruled out, it's positive. Go ahead and do your CTPA. In pregnancy, because we really try to avoid a CTPA, we do your VQ scan. And you, you, of course, you try to use your clinical decision rules, do your leg Doppler's first. Now, the ECG findings in P, we've discussed that, and now we're on the treatment for PE. For massive PE, especially when they're having shit, shit is my acronym for hemodynamic compromise. So S is shock, H is heart failure, I is ischemic changes. Now, you might not know what I mean, shock. You're having hypotension, you're having, um, you're having hypotension, you're having them um, having cold, clammy extremities. That, that, is, that is telling you that things are not fine. You're having heart failure, for instance, swollen ankles, um, raised JVP. Mm -hmm. Ischemic changes is, ischemic changes um, like chest pain like these in chest pain, you know, and, and all of that would alert you to ischemia. And then basically those kind of situations will tell you that they are not hemodynamically stable. So if they have massive PE, you want to do thrombolysis immediately with Altiplase, 100 milligram over two hours, ICU plus cardiology input. You want to consider embolectomy if thrombolysis fails. If it's a submassive PE, you want to anticoagulate still and then consider 
thrombolysis in deteriorating patients. Now, if it's a non-massive PE, then you do use your DOAX, like your apixaban, rivaroxaban, low molecular weight heparin if they are pregnant because you know that DOAX are contraindicated in pregnancy and usually treat for about three months in um, if you if it is um provoked if it is a provoked PE but if it's an unprovoked PE six months if it's a provoked PE but the source of provocation is from cancer you will treat with with um, the DOAX in for three to six months and then you tailor this um, DOAX based on their renal function is usually a pixaban 10 milligram twice a day for seven days but you could use And then you use five milligram BD for the remainder of the days, but you could use other DOAX. But like I said, depends on their renal function and other bits in their history. And how do you prevent early mobilization post op compression stockings? You want to give VTE prophylaxis a lot of trust, if not all. They have their their protocol, especially in orthopedics and also on the medical wards anyway, but more common in the surgical wards, they have their protocol for VTE prophylaxis post-surgery. Lifestyle changes like smoking cessation, weight loss are extremely important. Now, if you, if you catch and treat a PE, be on the lookout for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. It is very rare, but it is debilitating. Re recurrent PE, you could have a recurrent pulmonary embolism going on. There could be sudden death because imagine that the clot moves and then or you have bilateral PE and it's blocking the lungs. It's blocking the vasculature of the lungs. Then the patient and the oxygen, and that is why also it is extremely important to do your ABGs, to know what's going on with your blood gases because it could lead to sudden death. Then recurrent, we talked about recurrent PE, right heart failure from persistent pulmonary um, pressure and your core pulmonary. But here's the takeaway, guys. Pulmonary embolism kills. It gives clues. If someone has unexplained shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, tachycardia or collapse, P is always on your list. Use your well score. Don't skip the ECG and treat aggressively, especially when you see ECG changes. Most of all, don't be fooled by how normal they look. If they are sick and silent, Suspect PE. ECG is like a window in this case, not necessarily a diagnostic god. Um, national guidelines back you up, but use them wisely. PE can fool everyone, everyone, including me and you. Do have a great day and see you in the chats.